Hello everybody and welcome to our online Bible study. Since we can't have Bible study in church, we're going to bring it to you on YouTube. I'm excited to give this a shot and uh, we'll get going here with my usual Sunday morning study. We're going to start here in Acts 15 and look at chapters 22 through, I'm sorry, verses 22 through 41. So let's begin with what we should expect today. So, we're going to read about uh, the church leaders sending a letter to Antioch to encourage the brothers. This, this letter was um, the decision the church had made about, um, you know, they were, they were going to allow Gentiles, or, or not force Gentiles, to do all of the Jewish laws and things like that, okay? So they send this letter to the church in Antioch, which is a Gentile church, and then Paul and Barnabas are going to preach there and encourage the brothers, but they're actually going to separate later in disagreement. Um, so we'll look at four different sections today. First, the council in Jerusalem will write a letter to the church in Antioch regarding the keeping of the law. Uh, then the church is encouraged by the letter of the by the letter and the apostles. Then Paul and Barnabas will disagree and separate, but Paul will take Silas with him as his partner, and they will go and strengthen the churches that Paul had previously been preaching to. So, what, what to expect again here in a little more detail. After James gives his opinion on the issue of whether or not the Gentiles should keep the law, the rest of the church agrees and writes a letter with those details. They will send Judas and Silas along with Paul and Barnabas to Antioch to deliver the news and strengthen the brothers. After preaching and encouraging, Paul and Barnabas have disagreement and split. Each goes their separate ways to strengthen churches and evangelize. Right. So even though they split, they still both go and do the work of the church. They still go strengthen the churches and evangelize. Right. So we're going to learn today that it's not always about mission, but sometimes it's also about strengthening and encouraging existing churches, right? which is what we're, t we're used to. We tend to do a lot more strengthening and encouraging of members on Sunday mornings than evangelizing, right? and both are important. And then we're going to learn also that even the early church had disagreements. Okay, let's dig in. Let's get into the text. So, Acts 15, 22 to 29. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brothers, with the following letter. The brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. Greetings. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instructions, it has seemed good to us, having come to one accord, to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth, for it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. All right. We've got a question. We'll just talk about it since you can't answer me. Why do they send Silas and Judas along with Paul and Barnabas? Well, I think the answer here is for credibility purposes. The people in Antioch knew what side Paul and Barnabas were on. They knew they wanted to go out to the Gentiles and take this message to the Gentiles. They knew they didn't think the Gentiles should have to obey the Jewish laws. So, you know, if it was just them that came and said, oh yeah, we were at this council and they totally said that, that, that this was the way it should be done, just like we said to you before, they'd kind of be like, well, really? Like, where's the proof, right? And so they send Judas and Silas along with them as kind of, uh, you know, to give some credibility to say, hey, that we were there, this really was a decision, this wasn't just Paul and Barnabas, this was the whole church together agreed on this one thing. All right, make sense? Next question. Was the decision of the council God's will? How can we know? Well, uh, it was God's will. 
Um, first of all, in verse 28, they explain that this is the Holy Spirit's decision, right? Uh, just like everything else in Acts, um, it, 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 oh, it's the work of the Holy Spirit, that's what I'm trying to say. You know, the Holy Spirit is the act that's constantly behind all of these decisions, all of these movements, all of this preaching and proclaiming, etc. Okay? And on top of that, okay, on top of that, it aligns with the rest of Scripture. We saw, you know, a few weeks ago when we were talking about the actual deliberation before the writing of this letter, that James pulled out actual Old Testament Scripture that said, uh, yeah, this is what we're supposed to do. This is what the Old Testament said. This is what God has been saying all along, okay? So we know the decision was God's will because A, the Holy Spirit confirmed it, but B, it aligns with Scripture. And that's how we make decisions today. How do we know our decisions align with God's will? Well, do they follow the Scriptures or not, okay? Same deal back then. All right, let's dig in a little bit. It seemed good to the apostles, the elders, and the whole church, okay? So notice here that decisions are made um, democratically, right? It wasn't James, who was kind of the first church president, first church pastor, right? Um, he didn't get up and say, well, it's going to be this way. No, he got up and said, I think it should be this way. Now let's take a vote, okay? And, and it says, you know, the apostles, the others, and the whole church, right? They were all gathered together. They all made the decision. So keep in mind that every church member is important in making church decisions, okay? This means that you are important in making church decisions, all right? So please be there at voters' meetings. Please help out. We want your opinion. Since the very beginning, the church has been democratic and made its important decisions democratically, so let's continue that tradition, okay? Then it says, they sent two men and a letter with Paul and Barnabas. Um, this was to prove their decision was one of the whole council, okay? So no doubt they probably also like sealed this letter with the, the James seal or something like that. Um, and again, they send... Silas and Judas Long to kind of say, yep, we were there, we were witnesses, we saw this same exact thing happen, right? The whole church was here, and this is the decision that came. It was the decision that Paul and Barnabas wanted, yes, but it's also the right, biblical, spirit-led decision, okay? That, that We also saw that the letter was from the brothers to the brothers. Now, this is really cool, because we're all intimately interrelated in Christ, okay? The church is really one big family. I mean, that's amazing that, that, that we, can, we can call each other brothers and sisters. And keep in mind, too, here, this was the church in Jerusalem, which was full of Jews, writing to the church in Antioch, which was full of Gentiles, and they're calling each other brothers. This would have never ever, ever, ever happened before Jesus. But here we are, maybe a few years after the crucifixion, and they see each other as brothers. Why? Because they are related in Christ. Because Christ has made us all children of God. And if we're all children of the same Father, we are all brothers and sisters kind of gives you a new perspective on how you view everybody else in church, right? They're your brothers and sisters. They are who you're going to spend eternity with. That's really a pretty amazing thing. Okay, then it said that, the, this is the letter now, it says that some persons troubled you, right? He's talking here about what we call the Judaizers, okay? This is the one, this is the people in pretty much every town that Paul went to that said, nope, it, the, by the Old Testament said this and we need to keep all these laws for all of the, 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 the new Gentile Christians. They must be circumcised. They must obey the Sabbath. They must not eat pork, right? Um, so they're, they're Christians, but they also believe in keeping the law, okay? And, and we're going to learn you know, that that's fine for them, but they don't have to force that on other people because Christ kept the law, okay? And they were basically, they were troubling these Gentiles in Antioch, basically telling them, you're not a Christian unless you keep these laws. And of course, we know that that is very, very wrong. Jesus kept the law of Moses for us so that we don't have to, okay? And, you know, this was just, it was making it harder for them to be Christians. 
it was because they had to keep all these laws. And it was making them hard. It was making it harder for them to witness, right? If if you tell someone, I got this great news, you're gonna be a Christian. You just did the whole thing, and then you say, oh yeah, but you also can't eat bacon, and you gotta you gotta get circumcised. Like, oh, that's a game changer. Okay, no bacon, I'm out. You know, um, but with um, with with the, with the true gospel, with with Jesus satisfying the law and and taking away those Old Testament ceremonies and regulations, right? It's a little easier to say, oh yeah, like this is really cool. I want to be a part of this, and I don't feel like I'm burdened by it as much. Of course, there is still some, you know, burden and suffering from being a Christian, but of course, we also know that Jesus helps us to bear that burden. All right, moving on. Our beloved Paul and Barnabas, they they were James in this letter writes, they were men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord. Okay, why risk your life for the name of our Lord Jesus? Well, why not? He gave his life for us. And don't forget, because he did that, you have eternal life in heaven. That is amazing. So this life now doesn't matter. We can risk our lives now because we already have eternal life, right? And we see this example of Paul, and we're going to see it over and over again. We're just kind of getting started. He's going to go on a second missionary journey soon, and he just gets beat up, and he gets stoned, and he's going to get shipwrecked, and he's going to get thrown out of this city and thrown out of that city. And it's like, oh my goodness, dude, why are you putting your body through this? Well, because he can risk his life for the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he already has eternal life. That's pretty amazing. And we have that too. We have that too. They also reaffirm Paul and Barnabas here. They're basically saying, you know, th th these are our beloved friends. They're our beloved brothers. They've risked their lives for the Lord, right? These are good guys. And I'm, my guess is they're, they're reaffirming them to, to also, you know, um, clean up maybe a damaged reputation. Because these Judaizers came in and said, oh, Paul and Barnabas are wrong. No, no, no. They're terrible. Don't listen to them. They're, they're blaspheming. They're not right, you know. And uh, they're going to say, no, Paul and Barnabas were right. They're good brothers and sisters. I'm sorry, good brothers. And uh, just trust them, right? Uh, believe in them. They are, they are good. You know, they're, they're trying to build up the reputation again, basically. Okay, so moving on. They also write, it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Okay? So they, again, they affirm here the work of the Holy Spirit. They affirm that the Holy Spirit's behind this decision. It's not just something that they got together and said, well, we'd really like it to be like this, you know? Like, I mean, we're tempted to do that in church sometimes too. Well, oh, geez, it, it'd sure be nice to, to not give as much money to this missionary and instead we're going to take it and we're going to um, build a brand new, you know, playground for the kids. Or whatever. You know, I don't think that's bad. But we got to try and figure out where the Holy Spirit is leading us, you know? Hey, the kids got to play around. There's people in China need to hear the gospel. Maybe we should support that missionary. I, you know, again, I don't know. It depends on every specific situation. But it's not just what we like. It has to be, you know, what is God calling us to do? Where is the Holy Spirit leading us? Right? And again, we, we also talked about before how he affirmed um, this decision in the scriptures as well. This is what the Old Testament was saying all along, Okay. And I, I wrote down here Psalm 119 uh, to 105 right here. And that's that famous passage. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Right? Let God's word guide us in our decision making. All right. So then they say, you know, it's, it has been decided that we should lay on you no greater burden. Okay? Um, you, know, you don't have to keep all these ceremonial laws. You don't have to be circumcised. You don't have to stop eating bacon. Okay? Um, we don't want to lay a bigger burden on you. A bigger burden than you already have. Because don't forget, it is, it is difficult to be a Christian. It's not easy. You know, Jesus actually promises it's going to be difficult. He doesn't promise it's going to be easy. He says it's going to be hard to be a Christian. Right? It is already hard to be a Christian. Don't make it tougher. Don't say you have to keep all these rules. That's not the case. That's confusing because you can't in, in one sentence say, well, Jesus kept all the rules and died for us, and then say, but you got to keep these rules, right? It doesn't fit. It doesn't make sense, okay? 
So, um, and you know, they, they, they affirm that it was indeed all Jesus, that is, they shouldn't make it harder to be a Christian, especially on these new Christians. And doing that makes it harder to witness too. You know, again, I kind of said this before, but it's a lot easier to, you know, it's, it's, it's easier to come to Christianity if you don't have to keep all of these burdensome rules, which aren't actually there for us to keep. All right. So, but they, they do give them a few rules. You know, they say right here, you know, if you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Okay. So they give them a few things and those few rules really are to strengthen the church and to keep them focused on God. Okay. Moving on to the next section, uh, verses 30 to 35. Let me get some water quick. It says, So when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. And after they had spent some time, they were sent off in peace by the brothers to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of God with many others also. Okay, got a map for you. So they started down here in Jerusalem, right? And they travel all the way up Israel. Okay, this is, this is Israel here. Now this is kind of where Israel ends. So now they're in Gentile territory, they're in Syria, okay, all the way up to what we call Syrian Antioch, way up here, okay. It's actually not that far enough, I would guess maybe 150 miles, okay. So they get up there, they, they read them the letter, and then Silas and Judas head the whole way right back down to Judea, okay. But then again, we're going to at the end that Silas must have come all the way back up, because he's going to go with Paul. So just to give you an idea of where this is, this is the Mediterranean Sea right here. Um, this is an island. I don't know which one. And this is like modern day Turkey up here. Egypt is down here. Italy and Greece are over here. I'm just showing off my geography knowledge. Um, so I like maps. There we go. Another question for me. Why do Christians need encouragement? Okay. We already talked about this. It's hard to be a Christian sometimes, okay? When the rest of the world is doing something, it's hard to say, no, I'm not going to do that, right? Peer pressure is a real thing, okay? It would be easy to say, yep, I'm going to go try to have as much sex as I can. It would be easy to say, yep, I'm going to spend all my money on me. It would be easy to lie and to cheat our way to the top at work. Those things are easy. Those things that the world expects. Those things, uh, uh, th th that's, that's, th that's the easy road, right? It's much harder to say, oh man, I could have sex with that person, but I'm not married to her, so I'm not going to do it. It's much harder to say, you know, I'm going to take a tenth of all the money I make, and I'm going to give it to the church and not spend it on myself. It's harder to say, I'm going to stay in this position while everybody else lies and cheats away to the top, and I'm not going to make as much money as them, but I'm going to do what's right. Okay? It's harder to do that. And don't forget, the devil is constantly trying to pull us away too. Okay? The devil is always tempting us, and it gets exhausting sometimes. Resisting temptation, it gets exhausting. It does. The devil is constantly trying to lie to us, say, oh, that's not true. You really believe that? The devil is constantly trying to pull us away, and it's hard to be a Christian, guys. It's hard to be against the world. It's hard to be against its, its pleasures and to, to focus instead on, on God. But it's worth it. That's why Christians need encouragement. They need encouragement because it is hard but it's also worth it. And we have to constantly be reminded amidst the struggle that in the end, it is worth it. Okay? So we need to be encouraged. That's why we need to be in church. That's why we need to be praying. That's why we need to be reading God's word. You need that constant encouragement to keep you on the path. 
because the end is worth it. Okay, next question. Why do Paul and Barnabas teach? I'm sorry, what do Paul and Barnabas teach and preach? The text said they were teaching and preaching the word of the Lord. Beautiful. Same things that we should be teaching and preaching to answer. We do a good job of that here at Trinity. A lot of churches, uh, you wouldn't believe it, don't teach and preach the word of the Lord. But that's what the early church preached. That's what Paul always preached. I mean, over and over and over again in Acts, we see that over and over and over. I mean, Paul literally wrote the words of the Lord. Okay? Um, this is what we should be preaching as well. Why? Because these are the words of eternal life, as John says. Okay? This is the word that gets us to heaven. This is the truth. This is maybe not the easy road, but it's the good road. It's the road that's going to make you actually fulfilled. The road that's actually going to satisfy you. The road that's actually going to lead you to eternal life, which is all that matters in the end. Okay? So we teach and preach the word of the Lord. That is what is encouraging. That is the story of what God did for us. And he did a lot. It's a beautiful story. You know that. All right, so they went down to Antioch to deliver the letter. Um, you're like, uh, Vicar, I just saw on the map that Antioch is north of Jerusalem. You're right, it is, but it's also further down in elevation. So in Bible times, when they said they went down, it means they went down the mountain, down in elevation, not down south like we tend to say. Okay, so... They delivered the letter. They faithfully carried out the task the church gave them. I just want to point out something kind of interesting here. Um, you know, Silas and and Judas, you know, they're just like these regular guys living in Jerusalem. And the church says, hey, we want you to go with Paul and deliver this letter. You know, walk for a week straight in the dusty, hot Israeli weather and get up there and, go, you know, leave your family here. I don't know if they had families or not. Maybe they did, but they went. They did it. I can imagine they, they might not have wanted to do that. They might have just wanted to stay home. But they went and they did it. They carried out the task the church gave them. Okay, And this is encouraging for us. Because the church has a lot of tasks to do. Okay, Are we carrying any of them out? We should be. There's a lot we're called to do, a lot we're to help with. A lot we're, we're called to, uh, things we're called to, you know, just to do as Christians, right? Are we doing them? Are we faithfully carrying out those tasks like Silas and Judas? Okay? So they get down, or they get up to Antioch, but also down to Antioch, and they read the letter, and the congregation rejoiced because of its encouragement. Okay, again, it brought this encouragement because they weren't unnecessarily burdened, and the gospel shone through. Okay, I wrote this down to read to you. It was as if they thought this: we heard the gospel at first and thought it unbelievable. Would God really die to forgive our sins and rise to give us salvation? Could this really be a free gift? We accepted it, and it was amazing. We believed the gospel. We believed that it was truly a free gift. But then others came and tried to dissuade us. They tried to tell us that it wasn't free, and there really was a catch, that our initial trepidation was actually valid, and that we, and we became discouraged. We didn't know what to believe anymore. Our heads were telling us one thing, but our hearts another. But now you have come and you have assured us that indeed the gospel is true and it is free. Once again, our hearts are happy and we are encouraged. Okay, This encouragement is, is there because the gospel shines through and the gospel is encouraging. There is nothing more encouraging than knowing that you don't have to do it. That God did it for you. Because you and I, we can't do it. It would be so discouraging to think that I had to keep every law. I would, I would last for literally like 10 minutes. And I'd slip up and I would be just discouraged the rest of my life. How encouraging it is to hear that you don't have to do it because Jesus did it for you. Praise be to God. That is so encouraging. And we have eternal life because of what Jesus did. And we should respond the same as they did, right? They 
responded here with rejoicing. Shall we do the same? Right? We, we, got, we have the free gospel. We have eternal life in paradise because of what Jesus did. That is so beautiful. That's just wonderful. Let us do the same. Let's rejoice. You're sitting there right now. Maybe you're by yourself. Maybe you got some kids or maybe your wife is there. Maybe your, your husband's there. Just give a little, you know, woohoo! And they'll ask, what's going on? You can say, we have eternal life. We do, right? This is cause for rejoicing. Praise be to God. All right, moving on. So Judas and Silas were prophets, it says, okay? Um, we, I'm not going to get into the debate about what th this particular instance of the word prophets means. Um, let's just... Let's just say this means they were guided by God to reveal his truth, okay? So I'm going to ask you quick, just think about it. You know, do you feel like you have the gift of prophecy? Have you ever felt like God is guiding you to reveal his truth? You know, I guess I personally feel like God guided me to be a pastor. Like, by being a pastor, I would reveal his truth. And you don't have to be a pastor to be a prophet, right? But I think maybe a lot of pastors are probably prophets, Um and, and we're not going to, again, we're not going to just talk about what this word means. This is just kind of my thoughts on it, right? But have you ever thought about, you know, do have I ever felt God guiding me to tell his truth to somebody, right? You'd be a prophet. There's a big discussion of this in 1 Corinthians 14. Um, yeah, we're not going to get into it. We'll just leave it at that. All right. So, uh, next part. They encouraged and strengthened the brothers, okay? Two things. Encouraged, strengthened, okay? They encouraged by preaching the gospel. What could be more encouraging? Are you doing this? Okay, right? The gospel is the most encouraging thing in the world because it's the only thing that says you get to heaven not because of what you do, but because of what Jesus did for you. I mean, literally, there is nothing more encouraging than that because there's nothing that is worth more and there's nothing that is so freely given, okay? So then are you doing this? Are you using the gospel to encourage people, okay? I'll tell you, as a, a vicar, right, and I, I've gone out and gone on, you know, to hospital calls and shut-in visits and people have died uh, and people are sad about it and, and people are in a lot of pain out there, right? I could never, never, Go on those visits without having the gospel. I don't know what I'd say to people. You know, when somebody looks at you and says, Yep, yeah, I can't walk, and now my arms have stopped working too, and I, I'm just kind of sitting here, and I can't really see anymore, and I'm just here. What do you tell that person? You tell them, uh, uh, Dude, Jesus died for you. You've got eternal life. I know this is really hard right now. I can't even imagine how hard it is. But I can tell you that someday you're going to walk again. Someday your arms are going to work. Someday you're going to see, and you're going to see streets of gold. You're going to see, like, jewels in the walls of, of the city of Jerusalem, Revelation says, right? You're going to see the glory of God. Right? That's encouraging. I don't know what I would do on those visits if I didn't have the gospel, but thank God for the gospel because that is always there to give encouragement. And it's always the most encouraging thing. It's wonderful. Use it. Then it also says they strengthened them, okay? I think what it's getting at here is they, they exhorted them to remain in the faith, to cling to the gospel, right? Again, like we talked about, it is hard to be a Christian, right? You need to have your faith constantly strengthened because you're constantly getting messages from the world that are contrary to your faith. The devil is constantly trying to pull you away. And if, if we're not constantly strengthened, we grow weaker by his constant buffeting, his constant pulling, his constant tempting and eventually give in. So we need to be strengthening people. We need to encourage them and exhort them to remain in the faith because in the end, that's all that matters. So 
you're in church to be strengthened by the gospel, to be reminded that of what God did for you, to be reminded that of what you have in the end because of what he did. Are you doing this for others? You know, and you see their faith faltering. Are you strengthening them? Okay. We also as Christians should be doing this. All right. So then after they were there a while, they were sent off in peace. This is just Silas and Judas right there. They go back to Jerusalem. Okay. Then Paul and Barnabas, see, they stayed there, though, and they were preaching and teaching the word of the Lord. Okay, again, what are they preaching and teaching? The word of the Lord. That is beautiful. Um, the, 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 this, is, this is the Bible. This is the, the, the words of salvation, the words of eternal life. This is what Jesus did for us, and this is what we have now because of what Jesus did. You don't forget, though, this is also... The, the law and the gospel. This is, you need a Savior, and you have a Savior. Okay? Um, they use two different words today. They say they're preaching and teaching, right? Both are important, but there is a distinction, right? Preaching is, is um, it's, it's proclaiming. It's just, you know, you have eternal life, right? Teaching is, is kind of taking somebody's situation and... Um, and applying the information to their situation. I, I think preaching and proclaiming tend to be more one-sided, whereas teaching tends to be more of a, a, a dialogue, right? You know, they're, they're both important. And what do we preach and teach? We preach and teach God's Word, right? This is what they did. This is still what we should do. This is so important, okay? I, as, as many of you know, I used to be a history teacher, right? I love history. It's the greatest thing in the world besides the gospel. And I thought, I'm, and I literally like made up a PowerPoint about, you know, here is why history is the most important subject in school, you know? And I never actually got to use that PowerPoint because I realized something. I realized there is something more important than history. I want to teach that. The one thing more important than history is God's word. Okay, so let's preach and teach that most important thing also, right? I'm not saying we have to always do that, but, you know, as we teach other things, as we talk to our friends about other things, try to throw in that Word of God. And we're here in church, we're definitely going to talk about the Word of God. All right, question again, how can we encourage other Christians? Think about that for a moment. How can we encourage them? I think the same way, preaching and teaching. I think also praying, okay? I think also by sharing a testimony, you know? This is where I, I was down and out this one time, you know? And guess what happened? God helped me with the gospel in this way. I'm going to help you by this story, right? And I think also just being there for people, listening to them, turning them to God and his word, just helping and serving them, Okay? We should be encouraging people. Don't forget that. All right, next. Acts 15, 36-39. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark, but Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had gone with them to the, wor to the work. So there arose a sharp disagreement, so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. So why was it a good idea for Paul and Barnabas to revisit the churches? Okay, that's what we've been talking about. To encourage and to strengthen, right? We're constantly being bombarded by the message of the world. The devil is constantly trying to turn us away from God, right? So we need this constant encouragement and strengthening. So they were going to go revisit these churches and give them that encouragement and that strengthening. That's so, so, so important. I, can't, I cannot stress that enough, how important it is to be encouraging and strengthening people like this. Okay? Because... The world is constantly pulling us away. The devil is constantly pulling us away. We need to be in church every Sunday. We need to be doing this for our friends outside of church. Strengthening, encouraging. Okay? 
Then they had a dispute. What is their dispute? Over their dispute is over Mark. Okay, this is John. This is the guy that wrote the Gospel of Mark. Okay, and uh, we'll get into that in a little bit here. So let's go. Paul said, Let us return and visit the brothers. The brothers are in every city where they had proclaimed the word of God. Okay, so we see here the word is powerful, right? There were brothers in every city where they had proclaimed the word of the Lord. That means the word of the Lord did its thing, right? Romans, in Romans, we hear that faith comes by hearing the word of God, right? The word of God worked. They went to these places, they preached the word of God, and they became brothers. They became fellow Christians, okay? This is beautiful. So they, they go to return to revisit these people that they had previously proclaimed to, to proclaim to them again, to let that word work and to let it encourage and strengthen and build them up and, you know, grow their faith. Okay? Paul wants to see how they are, he says, right? I think what he means here is, you know, really, how is their faith? Right? He, he, I'm sure he wants to, you know, see his friends again, see how his buddies are doing. But it's also especially, you know, how's your faith, right? I know the devil's trying to pull you away. How are you doing? How's your faith? So don't forget, too, it is also important for us to check on one another, right? Um, the devil and the world and our sinful nature are always trying to trick us. They're always trying to lead us away from God, okay? This has been a constant struggle in my life as I have really started to, you know, care more about what the people around me believe, you know? As I talk to my friends about this, and it's like one of like, oh yeah, we got we got a breakthrough. We got a breakthrough. We're, they're on their way to becoming Christians. And then the next week, they're, they're like totally gone. It's like, what happened? I thought we were on this beautiful path up to, you know, wonderful. The word of God was working. And a week later, the devil had pulled them away. Okay? This is constantly happening. It's happening in our church, Right? People are there, people are coming, and then all of a sudden they're gone for four weeks, and then they're gone for eight weeks, and then they're gone for six months, and then never come back again. Okay? We need to be checking up on each other. The devil is tricky. He's trying to pull us away. This even happens to pastors, right? Check up on each other. Make sure people are in the Word of God. Make sure their faith is strong. Make sure they, they you know, they're not doubting. See how they are. Okay, so I think this is awesome. We should we should try to do this in our church too. We should have we should have church friends that we're checking up on. Okay. So Paul's proposal is a good one, but a dispute arises. Right? Barnabas wants to take with them John called Mark. Um, this is Mark, the writer of the second gospel. Okay. His his. Jewish name was John. His Greek name was Mark. Okay. Um, fun fact, he's supposedly buried in Venice. Um, and that's where the St. Mark's Basilica is. If you ever get a chance to go, after the coronavirus, go. It is so beautiful. I'm, I'm, I, feel my, I feel incredibly fortunate to have seen it. It's beautiful, right? Anyways, back on topic. Um, they want to, Barnabas wants to take John called Mark we actually find out, and I forget which book of the Bible, but we find out that um, Mark is actually Barnabas' cousin. So there's a little bit of like family stuff going on here. You know, and Paul's like, no, we're not taking Mark. And, um, all we know is that he had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Okay? And so really what I think is going on here is that they had taken Mark on a previous journey, okay, and we can't be certain, but it seems like Mark, um, well, we can be certain that he abandoned them, but we don't know why. And I, my, my guess is probably he saw how difficult this work was. He saw how dangerous it was. And he said, uh, no, I'm out of here. You know, I'm, I'm not going to risk my life. Are you kidding me? I got a lot of life to live yet. Okay. It's hard. It was Paul's life was hard. You read Acts, you read Paul's letters, his life was hard. Few people could have done what Paul did. Okay? And Mark at first didn't have that strength, so he abandons them. Okay? And Paul says, no, I don't trust the guy. We took him before and he put our whole mission in jeopardy. He left us high and dry. 
I'm not taking him. And Barnabas says, come on, give him a second chance, right? We actually do learn later on that um, in Paul's letters, he'll write that he finds Mark useful and he, he does come to appreciate Mark again. So Mark, Mark had a, a mistake of his youth as we're all prone to making um, and, and chickened out. And again, put yourself in Mark's shoes. If you'd have been with Paul, I'd have chickened out, probably, most likely. Um, you know, it's impressive that he even went in the first place. Um, but, you know, um, he does come to, to be a strong, firm apostle, a strong, firm proclaimer of the word. And he's even going to write a book of the Bible. It's pretty good stuff. Oh, we kind of talked about this, I guess. We don't know what caused Mark to abandon them. It was likely fear at the opposition they encountered. Um, it could all, you know, just also kind of be in that being unwilling to start his new difficult life. So we, we, we can be reminded here then that we must always be prepared to give it all for the gospel, okay? And this is just the case, right? Um, we, we don't often think about this, but we should be ready to give everything for the gospel. Okay? That that's that's it. Nothing is more important. You know, if if it comes down to it, if somebody says, I'm gonna shoot you, or you're gonna say you don't believe in Jesus and I'll let you live, you gotta say, okay, shoot me. Okay? But it's not just that, it's you know, are you are you prepared to give your your every day to the gospel? Are you prepared to give some of your money? Are you supporting missionaries who are literally giving their lives for the gospel? Are you prepared to, you know, to spend even an hour a week um, evangelizing or serving or something else, right? And why stop at one hour? Let's go more, okay? Um, I think we get pretty caught up often in our... You know, I gotta have I gotta have my Netflix time. I gotta have my my time to grill. I gotta have my movie night. I gotta have you know. And I'm not saying those things are bad at all. And we do need time to rest, certainly. But I think a lot of us get more time than we need. We gotta remember, guys, that the gospel needs to be proclaimed. There are people out there that are going to hell. That's the simple fact of it. And God has given you and me the mission of telling them about him. Serving them, proclaiming to them, defending the Christian faith, giving to others to help them Proclaim this word, right? These are responsibilities that we do have. Are we doing it? You know, maybe in another sense, you know, you're at work. This happened to me when I was a teacher, right? I was in a public school. People put down God or, you know, I was asked to, okay, I was taught history, right? So you got to, you got to teach like the beginning of the world. The book says, one million years ago, human beings discovered farming. Well, I don't, I don't believe that. So were you going to stand up and say, that's what the book says, but no, that's not what I believe. This is what I believe. You know, are you going to say that or are you going to just go, well, what's the book says this? Are your friends at work are picking on whatever? Are you going to stand up and say, you know, I, I believe in Jesus. I believe he's real. You know, are you willing to give your time, your money, your comfort, your freedom, your safety for the gospel? Mark wasn't at first, but he became willing, right? So let's take a lesson from Mark. I think we've all had moments in our lives, I certainly have, when we weren't ready. But I want you to take a moment now and just prepare yourself. Get ready. There's nothing more important. Nothing. Get ready to go do it. To take the gospel to people at 
whatever the cost, and start small. Give up your one hour of TV time a week. Give up going out to eat once so we can give the money to a missionary. Start, you know, with a little thing at work. The more you do it, the easier it's going to get, and the more you're going to love doing it. Promise. And don't forget, it's worth it. It's worth it because in the end, none of that stuff is going to matter. In the end, we all have heaven. In the end, you're going to look back. You're gonna, when, you're, when you're in heaven, you're going to say, considering what I got up here, this is... It was sure stupid of me to deny God at work that time to not look foolish. <laughs> right? You're going to say that. So let's spread that gospel, no matter the cost. It's worth it. All right. Then there was a sharp disagreement that arose, so they separated from each other. Okay, so keep in mind here that divisions do happen. This is, in a way, neat. I mean, it's bad, but it's neat that this even happened in the earliest of churches with the holiest of men, okay? And it's, it's neat in the sense that it's kind of like, whew, we're messed up today, but they were messed up too. We're not that much worse than they were, okay? It's comforting in a weird way. It's not good. Divisions are never good, okay? But church unity we see is not the highest good. And some people put it there. Some people say, we can sacrifice all the doctrine to have unity. Okay? Now, if, if it was like, well, we have to wear robes on Sunday or give up church unity, the answer would be, we'll go with church unity. Okay? But if it's, we have to give up the doctrine of justification by grace through faith to have church unity, heck no. That's way more important. Okay, so church unity is not the highest good. It is really, 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 really important. Okay, but so is the truth. Don't forget that. So uh, it's interesting, you know, instead of becoming embittered and, and consumed by anger, they just separate, right? And they both continue to go and do the Lord's work. It's, it, they, they don't let this feud hinder their, their, their mission. They just say, okay, I don't agree with you, you know, Barnabas, but I'm going to go this way. You go that way. We both have the same purpose. We're both in this for the gospel. We're both in this for Jesus Christ. Okay? Let's just separate and go our own way so we can keep doing the Lord's work. Okay? So important that we're doing the Lord's work. So how can this inform our church disagreements today? Well, again, we have to remember um, that... Um, it's not the highest good. Church unity is not the highest good. This is going to happen. When they happen, let's look in the Word. Let's try to figure it out. Okay? Um, let this comfort us a little bit to just say, you know, uh, we're not that much worse. There's always been problems. There's always been disagreements. All right. Last section, really quick here. But Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Okay, why is the grace of the Lord important in this circumstance? Okay, um, first of all, I think it's you know there is there is this this grace that is over this split between Paul and Barnabas, right? God forgives them for for their human natures, their butting of heads, their you know, and and we can still have that grace too today. But I think it's also important because. They go out preaching and teaching under the grace of the Lord. When they mess up, there's grace. When they get beat up, there's grace. If they get killed, there's grace. They have eternal life by the grace of God. There's grace. So why does Paul want a partner? What can we learn? This is pretty cool to see. Um, I've I've tried evangelizing on my own. It's hard because, you know, it's, it's nice to have someone there to back you up. Someone there who, who's, just, who's got your back, who's behind you, who's, who's there to help you out. Um, when, when we're on our own, it is a lot tougher. So we can learn that 
we go out doing this stuff, take a part with you. Take someone you trust with you. Take someone who, who's going to help you out, who's going to give you encouragement and strengthen you, and who you can encourage and strengthen as well, right? So we can learn it is good to, to work together to strengthen these churches, even today. Okay. Really quick, Barnabas took Mark and went to Cyprus. Paul took Silas and went through Syria and Cilicia. So they were commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. Um, the, the Greek word for commended here means to entrust for care or preservation. Okay, so basically they were they were entrusted to God's grace. Okay, for their care and preservation, uh, they, they were under the grace of God. If they messed up, there was grace. If they got killed, there was grace, right? They were, they were doing this underneath that promise from God that they already had eternal life. It's beautiful. And that's the same for us. We serve. We proclaim under the grace of God. Okay? So when we mess up, which we're going to, when we chicken out, which we're going to, there's grace. Repent. There's grace. Um, when we get made fun of, when we get put down, when we get, maybe you get beat up, there's grace. It's worth it. You already have the grace of God. What more could you ever want? Of course, our sinful flesh wants a lot more, but Really, when you think about it, we have everything we could ever need because we have the only thing that eternally matters. Heaven, eternal life, by the grace of God. Okay? Um, and of course, you know, this is where we should put our hope and trust to in God's grace. And like this church, we should also be pointing our brothers and sisters um, consistently to the grace of the Lord. This is the center of our message. This is the center of Christian teaching that God, in his grace, gave his son to die for us in our place so that we can have eternal life. We don't deserve it. It's given to us as a free gift. That's what grace is. We don't deserve it, but it's given to us anyways as a gift. That's beautiful. So, they went about strengthening the churches, okay? They taught and they preached the word. They answered questions. They exhorted against the teachers of the world, okay? Um... Like we've talked about, you know, kind of this whole time today, they strengthened these churches by giving them the word of God. Okay, the word is so important. That's where the strength comes from. They answered the questions they had, you know, because sometimes the devil tries to pull us with doubts. Maybe he says, you know, well, did, did um, Adam and Eve, were they really the first parents, you know, or was there a, a ancestor a million years ago? They probably weren't asking that question, but, you know, they answered questions like this. And they also just they exhort against the temptations of the world, right? Remain strong. Remain steadfast. Focus on God, not yourself. Why? Because you focus on God, you trust in God, you have eternal life. That's why. That's the only reason. That's the only reason we need. We do everything because we have eternal life. Not, for, not to gain it, because we have it. So we should try to fight off those temptations and focus on God instead of ourselves because he's given us eternal life. It's beautiful. All right, I'm kind of worn out. This is exhausting. But let's, we got, this is just the last thing here. This is just the map, right? So um, they start off here in Antioch. Paul and, I'm sorry, Barnabas and Mark go over here to Cyprus. And Paul goes up to Cilicia. Remember, Paul is from Tarsus. So he's kind of going back home. And they're going to strengthen people here and strengthen believers here, right? Give them the word. Strengthen their faith against the temptations of the world. Keep them strong. We're doing this right now. We should do this in our churches too. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you for being strengthened. Of course, when I teach, I also get strengthened. This is a great thing. I really appreciate you all tuning in. Why don't we say a quick prayer and then uh, I'll let you go. Dear God, thank you for your grace. Um, please help us to do everything because of the grace you've given to us. 
Please help us, God, to go and strengthen and encourage other Christians. Help us to take the gospel and, and tell them all about what you have done for us, Lord. Help us, um, even though this mission is difficult for us, God, because we're selfish, uh, help us to, to remember that you've, it already, you've humbly given everything to us. And help us to, to humbly go out and serve you as well, God. Um, we just ask, we ask for your help in this because we're, we're sinful people. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for watching. I hope you guys have a marvelous day.